So, with that, uh, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our speaker today, uh, Rob Slagle. Uh, she has some interesting insight into the tire industry, Goodyear Tire and Rubber, and its ties with our local community. He is a resident of Litchfield Park, and he worked for Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company at one point, and has spent 35 years in the tire business running his local family tire stores. Please help me welcome Mr. Rob Slagle. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, I'm honored and humbled to be invited to uh, do this today. Um, we're just a bunch of uh, old and new friends getting together to share a few ideas. So um, this this will definitely uh, the success of this will definitely depend on some questions and answers from from the audience today. So. Uh, during this at any time, if you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand. I love questions. Uh, it means that we're interacting together and it's not just a, a lecture, which I am not a lecturer, more of an idea sharer. But um, hello and thank you for coming. Um, just a little bit about myself. As Lisa mentioned, uh, my family started SNS Tire in uh, 1976 right here in the West Valley. Uh, our first store was in Peoria, then we opened a store in Goodyear, right on Highway 85 was the first location and it was moved to, to um, Dyser Road just south of the I-10 freeway and then we also had a store in Surprise. And I say had a store, it was kind of bittersweet. In late November of 2021, we received a very favorable offer to um, buy us out of the retail tire business from a large private equity firm and they're rolling out right now as we speak they're rolling out as big brand tire they hired all of our employees they're trying to do business just like we did for 46 years here in May and um, so it was, it was bittersweet but um, between COVID and everything going on in the world we felt like it was the best um, and for those of you who don't know, my father played a huge role in, uh, in our company uh, up until about five years ago when he passed away. And then our mother, uh, my brother and I, his name is Dan, uh, my, my uh, mother took over the company and she really wasn't suited to run a, a tire company. It was growing by large amounts every year and it was just better to sell so uh, we'll talk a little bit about what Dan and I do now today but um, I'm a graduate of NAU I graduated in 1986 um, my first job was uh, with the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company uh, 86 87 and 88 and my lovely wife Susan is in the back row. She works for Litchfield Park and has for many years. And before that, she was with the uh, Litchfield Park School District. So we feel like we're pretty deeply rooted in the in the West Valley, and especially right here in in Litchfield Park. My daughter, who couldn't make it today, uh, works at the Wigwam. Um, back when COVID basically shut the Wigwam down, they had four. Uh, employees on property only and she was one of the four so uh, she's done quite well with uh, the wigwam um, about enough that's enough about myself um, I want to talk a little bit about the Litchfield Park Historical Society they do a great job of collecting presenting and storing the history of Litchfield Park if you have not been by the museum lately I would encourage you to drop by and visit their newest exhibit as Lisa mentioned rolling on rubber I was there last week and I was truly impressed. They do a, just a terrific, terrific job. Um, and again, this lecture's success will depend on lots of questions, so please feel free to ask a question if you have one. Either ask it during or after we're done. So my goal here today is to try to make a clear connection between the city of Litchfield Park, the Wigwam, and the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. So we ask ourselves, how and why did all this take place right here in the West Valley, starting in the early 1900s? The answer is simple. It's called long staple cotton. 
As it turns out, long staple cotton was used heavily in the production of all types of rubber products back in the day, and it helped strengthen whatever it was being used in, including all types of rubber tires. During World War I, cotton was mostly available from Egypt. G German U-boats were sinking ships bound for the U.S. at an alarming rate. Many of these ships were carrying much-needed cotton used for our industries, including the tire industry. On top of that, the boll weevil may, was making its first appearance in cotton crops in the eastern United States. So our founder, Paul Litchfield, a Goodyear executive, and the gentleman that invented the first tubeless tire among many other patents, heard that the climate here in the West Valley was very near to that of Egypt's. So he set out here to find a place to grow his own cotton for the use in Goodyear's tires. In 1916, he visited this area then known as the Salt River Valley. He was eventually able to purchase around 36,000 acres. Of the 36,000 acres, 5,000 acres was set up as Litchfield Ranch. The name was changed to Litchfield Park in or about, on or about 1926 by the United States Postal Service. In 1929, the Wigwam officially opened its doors, not as a Four Diamond Resort, but as a retreat for white collar Goodyear executives wanting to escape the harsh Ohio winters. At that time, Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company was owned, had owned much of the land to the south and west of the current day Litchfield Park and was being farmed as co a cotton crop known as long staple cotton. These cotton fields became tire proving grounds for many of Goodyear's new products and innovations of that time. It was because of the amount of testing done here by Goodyear, they were able to come up with many firsts in the industry, in the tire industry, securing its title of being the number one tire producer in the world for much of the 19th century. An early Goodyear tire design known as the Diamond Tread found its way into early wigwam decor and can still be found in and around the resort's main lobbies today on the interior and exterior. So that's a picture of a tractor obviously with Goodyear's design using the diamond tread. Here's a closer picture. And if you look at that closely and then sometime go over to the wigwam and walk the halls and lobbies there, you'll see that many, another close-up picture of the diamond tread, you'll see that early architecture of the wigwam incorporated a lot of this diamond design. And that's, again, still prevalent today after, I don't know, 60 or 70 years or more. Early tires were handmade primarily of natural rubber and cotton fiber used to strengthen the tread and sidewall and to prevent punctures, which was a big problem back then. Early tires hand built by tire builders, it was very difficult it was a very difficult and dirty job by any standard. There's pictures in the museum of early tire builders and pictures of their hands all uh, calloused and, and, and dry from working with the stretchable natural rubber. A uh, couple of side notes here that you might find interesting. As we all know, the cotton gin was invented by Eli Whitney sometime back in the 1700s, late 1700s. His granddaughter uh, married my great-great-grandfather in 1860. So I have some early cotton in my blood. <laughs> Another side note that uh, I usually bring up during these talks and people don't quite understand until I describe it, 
Back then, if you had a four-ply tire, it was made of four plies of cotton fiber. Four plies. Today, nowadays, with the more modern materials, a four-ply tire could just have one ply of polyester in the sidewall and two plies of additional plies in the tread, making it a four-ply rated tire. So they all go back to that standard of how tires were made with cotton. If it's a 10-ply rated tire, it today, using the newer materials, it won't have 10 plies in it. It's rated for 10 plies, but it has fewer materials in it because of the ability of these newer, like rayon and nylon and so forth, to be able to provide more structure than just the cotton plies. Any questions about that? Did anybody else know that? No? Okay. Now you know. <laughs> With World War II looming, natural rubber was becoming scarce. The Bear Company, the aspirin people, invented synthetic rubber which holds many of the properties of natural rubber and is still widely used today. They invented it sometime in the 1920s and it was continued to be perfected. All the tire companies had their own version of natural rubber, um, but it all, it, it, most natural rubber has, I'm sorry, more synthetic rubber is, is in today's process of building tires than natural rubber. Until the mid-1970s, most of the tires produced in the U.S. were produced in Akron, Ohio. Unfortunately, that all changed, play, changed when the unions took over. That forced the production of tires to more labor-friendlier states. Not one tire is produced in Akron, today, Akron, Ohio today as a result. Another side note, I was uh, in, with my stint uh, with Goodyear in the 1980s, I went back to Akron for four weeks of training. They believed heavily in training. So you'd go back for two weeks and then you could come home and then you could go back for two more weeks to finish up your training. I spent a lot of time in Akron for those four weeks. It's a great little town. And I was in a cab one day and I, being the talkative person that I am, I started a conversation with the taxi cab driver and I asked him, you know, about his background and he said, well, I, I was a tire builder uh, back in the 60s and 70s and he said, unfortunately, the labor unions got so strong that they ran a lot of the production of tires right out of Akron, keeping in mind that every tire built in the U.S. back then, back in the 60s and 70s, and I even put the 50s in there, was made in Akron, Ohio. That's where all the tires were made for all of U.S. production and all exports. And again, today, there's not one tire made there. Now, that's not a knock on unions, but the unions did get so strong that they did force the major, major manufacturers to move their production. Say, go ahead, say that. No. If you have, yeah, but I'm... I say the disparity of income has really grown ever since. Yes. You've seen the shrink of unions and the disparity of income grow. Uh, that's what you're talking about being uh, labor-friendly. Well, I believe in capitalism, land, labor, and capital. Yeah, I would agree. Again, I'm not knocking, I'm not trying to force my opinion on anybody, but uh, I think, you know, companies, to, to build on that comment and then to move on, you know, I think companies can't move forward without employees. And I think today, employees are, for us anyway, when we were S&S and &S and now the business that we're running, uh, we feel our employees are our biggest asset, so you want to take care of them. You don't want to turn them over or anything like that. So um, I agree with you. In today's tires, there's very little natural rubber used, as I said earlier. In many of the 
tire manufacturing plants, you won't find many workers building tires. It's all automatic machines and robots that build tires with very little human interaction that takes place. I was fortunate enough to visit a factory, a tire factory, for a company called Trelleborg. Uh, they're an international company that builds farm tires and uh, they opened a new plant in South Carolina. Went back uh, probably 10 years ago now, maybe 12. And the plant tour, there wasn't one factory worker at all. The only thing that the, the, the humans touched were computers that made, you know, that were used to make the tires with the machines. Another side note. The older tire design was called bias ply or diagonal ply. Some of you folks may remember back before radials were invented. A bias ply or diagonal ply was prevalent up until about the 60s. And what that was, I, with the microphone on my hand, I can't really show you, but it was plies on the diagonal that were stacked on top of each other, depending on how many plies the tire had. So that's what they called on the bias or bias ply or diagonal ply. Now most all tires, including passenger and pickup tires, are all radial ply, which was invented by Michelin, unfortunately. <laughs> but Goodyear soon came out with radial ply tires, and that's what almost all cars, trucks, uh, semi-trucks, uh, all kinds of equipment all run on radial ply tires now. In March of 1987, Goodyear Tire and Rubber is forever changed. Sir William Goldsmith launched a hostile takeover of the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Luckily, the takeover was unsuccessful, but it still costs Goodyear dearly. To raise badly needed cash, Goodyear had to sell off its motor wheel division, Goodyear Aerospace, which is just down the, was down the street from us here, and our old friend, the Wigwam. I worked for Goodyear during this unsuccessful takeover. Early one morning I came into work and found 15 pages of Goodyear communication on our company printer, outlining what happened and how Goodyear was hoping to continue as a global market leader of the manufacturer of tires. It was a very interesting time if you were a Goodyear employee. Tons of turmoil and none of us were sure what was going to happen. Um, but Goodyear assured us that they were going to stick with their core business of producing tires and at that time they were doing a lot of auto service as well. In 1987, Later in 1987, Goodyear was forced to sell the Wigwam to Pinnacle's Suncor Corp for $221 million. Now keep that number in your mind because there'll be some more numbers coming your way. So they sold it to Pinnacle Suncor Corporation for $221 million. Four years later, a flailing Suncor Corp sold the Wigwam to uh, the Japanese firm Kabuto for just $70 million. And in 2009, JDM buys a note held on the Wigwam for $45 million. So today there's a movement to produce more tires here in the United States. Tire production had left the U.S. for cost-cutting measures to places like China, Thailand, India, all over. And for a while, that's where most of our tires were being produced. The shipping costs were reasonable, and you know, the, there was enough tires en route to the United States to be able to fill all of our needs at the time. New factories today are popping up all around the Southeast United States 
as I mentioned, I went to a new factory in South Carolina. South Carolina and the Southeast seems to be where they are uh, honing in on where tire manufacturers, international tire manufacturers, are building huge plants in the Southeast, uh, Tennessee, Georgia, South Carolina are all friendly states for these tire manufacturers. And it's a very clean business today. Almost zero emissions to build a tire. And you have to remember a tire is produced, the two major components of a tire is oil and steel. So it's, you know, those, and those, keep in mind that, that, you know, as I mentioned, these radial ply tires are, are with us forever. A tire is working 24 hours a day. If you think of either if you drove here in a golf cart or a car or a pickup truck, those tires out there on that piece of equipment is working right now holding the weight of those of that vehicle up. So it's they work 24 hours a day supporting the weight of the vehicle whether you're moving or not. And the other point I wanted to make is Steel belted radials, I mean, we all take tires for granted just like we take electricity and water and everything else for granted, but to have steel and rubber basically glued together to produce, to make a tire, that's, those are two very unnatural things. They don't, they don't participate well together. So the fact that they have steel belts glued to rubber and we're able to run down the road at 70 or 80 miles an hour with the load of our family or whatever and it is just an, it's an amazing it's an amazing thing. So with transportation costs on the rise, we've seen huge price increases in tires today. If you don't know that or haven't realized it, just go out and shop for tires. When we were in business up until late last year, uh, in 2021, we, we bought most of our tires through uh, the manufacturers, directly from manufacturers. So we kind of cut out the middleman. We don't. We didn't use warehouses at the time. We bought directly from the where, from the manufacturer's distri distribution center. Some of the manufacturers last year had four increases of five to eight percent each, just last year alone. So tires have increased. Most of that increase comes from transportation costs because not all of our tires are made here in the United States, some are still made overseas. In the business that my brother and I now run, where we, uh, we focus, it's a niche business where we focus on specialty tires. Tires like uh, if you walk out to the Wigwam golf course and you look at all the equipment there, those are the types of tires that we have and we do business with golf courses all over the United States. But at any one time, we have between 15 and 30 containers on order of these specialty tires from all over the world. Last year, surcharges were enacted on these containers. This is over and above the cost of the container. The surcharges for these containers were around $20,000 per container. So that is all added into the cost of the product, unfortunately. We have seen some price relief in 2022 on this container surcharge. It's gone down to about $15,000 per container. So today, my brother Dan and I run a specialty tire business, as I mentioned. We have warehouses in Glendale and Greenville, South Carolina. We do business with tons of golf courses, playing fields, school districts, um, ballparks like the, all the major league ballparks do business with us uh, here in the valley so anything that runs on turf or grass or any piece of equipment we usually will have that type of product and what's made us successful over the years in that niche business is we provide a large number of options for customers so if a particular tire isn't working on a particular piece of equipment we'll usually have something that will work better and might be cheaper so you can see in closing that paul litchfield has made a huge 
impact in our little community. And we can thank him and the Litchfield Park Historical Society for um, keeping that history in the forefront. So with that, I will open it up for questions. Hopefully somebody's got a question out there for me. Yes, go ahead and question. sure. Can you describe what the yeah, so we talked about the diagonal ply, which is tires, the plies stacked on top of each other. Radial ply, if you hold your hands together like this, that's a radial ply tire. The plies are next to each other. There's far less friction involved in a radial ply tire than there is in a bias or diagonal ply tire. And that reduction in friction is what makes the tire last because it reduces the heat that built, that's built up in the tire. Yep. Yep, in the back. Yeah, so I'm sorry. I, well, I'll get back to you in one second. I wanted to repeat the question. Lisa asked me to repeat the question. What's the difference between diagonal ply and radial ply was the question. So did everybody understand that? Okay, thank you, Lisa. Yes. So what makes the specialty tires that go on turf different? Well, they have a big footprint is the major difference and the tread design is very unusual and Lisa was nice enough to do um, some slides for me let's just see there's no turf tires in here but let's just see what she's got here that's early cotton and that's a rubber tree that's how they produce natural rubber and that's it so but um, so turf tires are designed to have a large footprint and when the equipment turns on grass, it doesn't make a divot in it. So turf tires usually have buttons on them, if you will, built into the tire to keep it from marking up the grass. I answer your question okay? Yep. Yes? So uh, tires today, are they about 10 ply tires? What's a steel belt and radio? Well, if we convert everything back to the cotton plies, today's cars all pretty much have four ply rated tires. Now, different manufacturers play around with different materials, um, but uh, the, your 10 ply that you referred to is probably more standard on a three quarter ton or a one ton pickup truck. But the, the passenger car tires are four ply rated. Some of the tires, if, and it'll say right on the sidewall, it'll, it could say one polyester ply in the sidewall and two steel belts, or it might have two steel belts and one nylon belt. What the nylon does is, uh, nylon shrinks as it gets warm or hot, and so it holds the belt package of the tire closely together. So if you have a a high-end sports car or some of the newer sedans that you know are you know are go fast they'll probably have a nylon belt still a four ply rated tire you won't see six ply tires on six ply rated tires on on cars on pickup trucks and trailers maybe but did I answer your question yeah, thank you. okay perfect yes are all tires dated as to when they were made Good question. I'm going to repeat that question. Were all tires dated when they were made? Yes. There's a born on date on one side of the tire. Both sides of the tire down by the bead has the manufacturer code and the plant code and then only one side has the date code. The date code prior to 2000 was a five digit code. You won't see many of those around today. The date code that they're using from 2000 on is a four digit date code. And again, sometimes people mount, the tire folks mount that information on the inside of the car or sometimes it's on the outside of the car. But that four digit code represents the week and the year the tire was made. So the first two digits would be 01 all the way to 52. And then the second digits would be the year, that, the last two digits, the year of the year the tire was made. So um, a, the typical code would be like 5020. So it'd be the 50th week of 2020. Answer your question? Yeah, and that's important for uh, vehicles like uh, 
motor homes and things like that that don't wear out the tread, but they get old anyway. Right, did you hear that? So RVs that do a lot of sitting around trailers and cars. I mean, if we don't drive our cars much, I mean, you want to try to buy the freshest tires you can. Some stores will try to push push over on you that this tire is a brand new tire, but it's important to know when it was manufactured. Typically speaking, um, especially today with so many of our tires coming from Asia and Europe, Pacific Rim. It's right now the, the when they say slow boat from China, well it's six months for a container to leave China to get here. So any tires made in the Pacific Rim are already six months old when they get here. And that's why there's a big push for American manufacturing. The labor has been cut so much because machines are doing most of it that they're able to compete with the low cost producers in other countries. Yes. Can you tell us about the recaps? Sure. I have so I do these talks every once in a while. I haven't talked about recaps in quite a while, but recaps kind of have gone out of favor lately, only because the cost of tires uh, prior to COVID have been so reasonable. But um, back in the day, on a car tire, you used to be able to buy recaps now they worked everywhere really well but here <laughs> because of the heat and what happened is because of the heat the recap tire uh, separated from the casing and you, you, you know you had a tire without tread on it after a while so um, they kind of gone out of favor now recaps are coming back a little bit which is a good thing because a casing uh, you know a tire itself when it goes to the landfill it takes about 250 years for it to decompose and so if we can get the ca casing of the tire which is the steel and the sidewalls and the beads if we can put another recap on top of that that casing stays out of the landfill for several cycles and you can recap truck tires are typically recapped we just drove back on I-10 on Sunday and the side of I-10 uh, from California to Buckeye is littered with tire pieces of tires. A lot of those are recaps, some of them aren't, but did I answer your question about recaps? Not too much today. Yes, let's take this one right here. What is the future of recycling tires into resurfacing roads? So the question was, what is the future of recycling tires into roads? And that's a great question because that's a great way to get rid of all these tires that we use. And the Maricopa County, for instance, uses rubberized asphalt. So there's a company out where the GM proving grounds used to be, if, well, all the way in Mesa. Um, and that's where all the waste tires go. And then they take those tires and they grind them up. They, they remove the steel from the bead and the tread and they grind up what's left and that ends up in our rubber, as rubberized asphalt in our roads and on playgrounds. And they use them for all t sorts of things. They use them in on some football fields as well uh, that use uh, fake grass. You had a question in the back? Oh yeah, so in our cars on the door jam, it, it has a recommended tire pressure for the tires. Um, when you get subsequent tires down the life of that car, is that tire pressure pretty much gonna stay for any kind of replacement tire that you get? Yes, that's why I think it's important today to replace with what's on it. Not necessarily the brand. You can go with different brands. You don't have to replace with the brand that's currently on it. But as long as the load index, which is a usually a two or a three digit number, and the speed rating, which is a letter, if, as long as you use those guidelines to buy your new tires, that I would use the placard on the side of the door. Did everybody hear that question all right? 
was it, uh, it was re referring to the placard on the dr driver's side door and the information that's on there about the tires and so yes as long as you replace with the same like tire I would continue using that and the reason that's important is because the tires that are on your car now may fit another car that might be heavier or lighter than your car and the sidewall pressure on the tire could be 35 41 51 who's to say what the sidewall pressure is but when when that tire is put in a different service the pressure the the working pressure needs to be for the car because those tires are holding up that car and it those tires could go on different vehicles does that answer your question yeah, yeah. any other questions yes um this is just a comment uh rob was able to get us a very very large goodyear tire that we have up at the museum and it's on the outside of the museum and if you go over to it the tread lifts up a little bit and you can see the cotton cording underneath that and the diameter of each cord is just very very small but it's one of i think you had a very hard time finding a cotton um, tread tire for us but we've got one up there if you want to see what they look like when you were made them thank you so well uh you know we did our family did a bunch of farm tire business in this area all the way out to harquahela valley and all over so um, i was walking through our yard one day at our peoria store where we where we stored a lot of our larger scrap tires and it wasn't the tread it wasn't this tread but it was a cleated tractor tire it's called an r1 that's got cleats as opposed to diamonds and the tire was pretty old and it was pretty abused and we must have taken it off and i i walked by it and we had we were in i was in talks with uh litchfield park historical society with trying to come up with a tire and lo and behold i stumbled across this one it's got a serial number on it but we're not sure when it was made i think it was made in the 50s but it's a tractor tire that stands about as tall as i am and it's a narrow row crop tire so it's kind of tall and narrow like the one behind me and i thought oh perfect this will be a, a great way to link tires with cotton with litchfield park and the wigwam basically so it's a it's a really a great piece not sure today we'd ever be able to find one of those they're probably long gone so thank you for that thank you yes sonny and then you had mentioned uh when you were working for for goodyear and uh they had the hostile takeover and they attempted hostile takeover that they had to sell the pen west for 221 billion that wasn't just the wigwam, was it? That was all the holdings? I, well, I'm not sure. Again, you know, just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's true, right? But those are some numbers I pulled from the internet. I believe I got that from wig, the wigwam itself. I think I got it from their website. Um, and it could have been all the holdings. I don't know. But um, at that time, it could have included the Biltmore golf courses as well. But they took a huge loss. I was thinking they owned City Hall, the current City very, Hall. Very possible. A lot of things in town, Sunpour owned. owned as a result of that yep. transaction. And then as I found it interesting as you went down that when Kabuto got it for $70 million, but I think that probably was just the Wigwam and maybe a few million. And then, of course, uh, JDM is pretty much just the wigwam. And, and, the, and the Biltmore. I just felt that in that same transaction, the wigwam also owned land. Yes. Is that Kabuto. And so I'm assuming that there's a lot more land because it was um, uh, Suncor that developed what was the Greens and then two and three, which is now the village. That was all part of the, the Suncor. I'd also like to point out this because it's my aggravation. SAPS, your electric bill, paid for those losses. <laughs> yeah, correct. 
Yeah. Yep, that is correct. They were pretty free with our money back then, weren't they? Yes. You had a slide about Sarah Ball. Was that a cotton? I want to thank Lisa. She was nice enough to put this slideshow together. When it when it comes to tech technical stuff, um, I'm great standing up here and answering questions, but putting something like this together is not my strong suit. So thank you, Lisa, for this. So yeah, it says Saravel Cotton. I can't tell you. I mean, you probably, so this is down at the bottom. It says Southwest Cotton Company, which was a division of Goodyear at the time. And that could have come out of the Saravel uh, Cotton Farm, which, you know, is just a few miles up the road here. That's very possible. Uh, it's July 24th, 1920. Thank you. The name is an acronym for Salt River Valley. Yep. Thank you for bringing that up. This is what I like. So we're all learning. I think I knew that at one time, but I forgot it. So, Lisa, you said there was another. Was there another? Is there another question over here? No, I was going to make the comment okay. about yeah. the Yep. Lots of history, and without the Litchfield Park Historical Society, this would all probably disappear, or you know, who knows what would happen to it. But we're very fortunate, very, very fortunate to have them and and the wigwam in our community and uh, our own city hall. Sonny, yep. The, the transition in reading some history about Paul Litchfield City, he also helped in the transition to a pneumatic tire as opposed to like a solid. I don't know a lot about that. Um, tires, early tires, you know, were on bicycles. And those were made of leather and all kinds of strange things. Nothing worked very, very, very well uh, until they came up with a, a rubber tire. And the early ones were solid. And the early cars were really more bicycles with motors on them than they were automobiles. And so that solid tire for bicycles ended up on early automobiles. And then the airless tire was invented. The, the, and boy, working out in the shop, I worked in the shop at our store for many, many years. That's where I cut my teeth. And so many of the wheels were dangerous back then. So Paul Litchfield helped design a wheel that was not as dangerous. If you, if for those of you who remember the clincher wheel, that was a wheel that basically, it was a round wheel with uh, basically one cut through it. I, it's hard for me to explain it, but that's how you would, that clincher was how you would dismount and remount the new tire. Later on, there was a lock ring wheel, which is still considered dangerous today, but a lot better than the clincher wheel was. So I don't know if I answered your question, Sonny, but Goodyear and Paul Litchfield, I can't, I don't know how many inventions Paul Litchfield had in his tenure at Goodyear. It was probably in the hundreds or more, um, but he was a very smart man and we're, again, I can't say that this enough, that we're lucky to be able to live in the community that he created for us. Yes? We'd like to invite you to come and see the exhibit because it has a lot of Paul Litchfield's patents up there. And some of them have to do with the pneumatic tire and the clincher and all of those sorts of things. Um, some of you might not know, but his father was a photographer and an amateur artist. And Paul Litchfield was very capable of drawing things. So when it came to designing these patterns, that was easy for him. So you'll see some of those in the exhibit, and that may answer your questions about what he was capable of doing. And from an outsider from Litchfield Park Historical Society, I did, as I mentioned, went through that museum. And the whole museum is great. The Rolling on Rubber exhibit is well worth your visit. It really is well worth it. Very well done very factual. All right, any other questions? We'll close it out. I really feel like this was an honor and a pleasure for me today. I feel like I'm back with old friends and neighbors and new friends. So um, 
the, the Litchfield Park Historical Society has my telephone number. So if you have a question and you want to email me or call me, feel free to do so. I'm sort of kind of retired now, but still working in the business. Um, being able to uh, let go of the retail part of our business uh, was a great thing for me because we were open Saturdays and Sundays and working crazy hours and so I don't do that anymore so I find myself figuring out what the next thing I need to do but anyway Lisa thank you for the invitation today appreciate it